there. All right, well, there's a look at the players and a look at the decks. It's time for round number two here at Pro Tour, the Lord of the Rings. I'm going to send it on over to Roy Riley and Corey in the booth. Hey, guys. Hello, and thank you very much, Maria. Welcome back to the tournament floor here. Riley Knight and Corey Baumeister for the first time today. Corey, so excited to be back in the booth with you, my friend. It's been a, it's been a, a long while. It's been a very long time, and what a better time than to have such great formats for this Pro Tour. It's going to be a blast. I can't wait. Absolutely, absolutely right. I'm a huge fan of Lord of the Rings. Have enjoyed playing this uh, format enormously. Obviously, my personal preference for green decks has um, not served me super well when it's come to the fun. But look, I've broken. A little rough. I've broken it. We'll find out that uh, <laughs> shortly. But look, down in the feature match area, we have Nathan Steyer waiting to play off against Federico Del Basso here. Federico, you can see from Italy, and his deck looks fantastic. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like Monty was saying, there's some commons, you know, that are not exactly ideal cards, but some of the powerful rares that we have, the Horn of Gondor, the One Ring, yeah. you know, really some really high powerful cards. So we'll just see if Nathan's deck is going to be fast enough, aggressive enough to yep. get under that, or if the power of the One Ring is going to be able to take over. And if you're just joining us, welcome. By all means, welcome from over or wherever you are around the world. It's so good to have you here in Barcelona for continued coverage of Pro Tour, the Lord of the Rings. Uh, we saw Nathan Stoyer draft earlier on today. Yep. Yep. Fantastic pack one. Pack two and three weren't so kind to him, but he pulled together a, a decent enough deck. Yeah, absolutely. Was missing a little bit of, uh, you know, some solid removal here, but a bunch of Marys here to be able to try to combo off with other legendary creatures, start getting some card advantage, and then try to really stop the opponent from doing anything with these three copies of Reprieve. Reprieve. When you're ahead on the battlefield with those things, Reprieve is exactly what you want to kind of close the door on your opponent. Traditionally, a, uh, an effect we find in blue uh, oh, comes, back, comes back to Ooh. the old card, Remand. That's <laughs> right. Uh, Reprieve, hopefully we'll get to see it played in the modern portion of the tournament a bit later on. But for now, opening things up, opening the account with a Rohirrim Lancer. One mana, yep. one ones. Don't tend to uh, cut the mustard too often in limited, but this one actually has been getting work done, and uh, it's going to be joined by a Battle Scar Goblin here. And here, one thing, Nathan is missing land three so far, so this is a huge draw step to see if we're going to have it. I think you found it. Oh, and the mountain, and the, the mountain exact well. perfect one that we needed here. So the Battle Scar Goblin gets sent back upstairs with the reprieve, but the mountain now means that we can see one of the most powerful uncommons in white. It is Eowyn here. Eowyn does a ton of work really makes a com uh, combat an absolute nightmare yeah. for your opponent. And also, with this, with that stat line, 2-4, high toughness creatures, yeah. really important in this format. Yeah, really important not being able to get Smite the Death List, yep. other removal spells like that. And just the fact when you're in these kind of race scenarios like this, Vigilance actually really, really comes up uh, in this format. When you have these two aggressive decks against each other, maybe not exactly what we usually see is two aggressive decks against each other because, well, you know, blue, black, that kind of controlling strategies is actually quite strong uh, in this format, but it's going to be very, very powerful in this matchup here. Swarming of Moray now for Del Basso. He amasses two, makes a treasure token as well. Pretty unassuming card, Swarming, but yeah. I, I've seen it do some good work. Yeah, I thought it was going to be a lot sure. better than it, it kind of ended up being, but, uh, oh, wow, here's big a big one. turn here for Stoyer as he gets in with Merry, Esquire of Rohan. In addition to uh, Eowyn there, draws a card. You love to see that, and hitting his land drop. So things going very well for the defending Pro Tour champion here. Yep, absolutely. That's a great start. This is really what Nathan's deck is trying to be doing. Mm -hmm. Pairing Mary with either a ring bearer creature or another legend and get that card advantage going. Uh, definitely the way he's going to be taking advantage of this game. And I imagine Mary there was given first strike, so the trade wasn't on the table with that army. Uh, yeah. Thanks to Eowyn's uh, triggered, uh, triggered ability here. So back to Del Basso, who has to now find a way to uh, kind of stem the bleeding a little bit, right? Yep. Stem the bleeding will be what we try to do from, from Basso here. But the reprieve, second reprieve here, is going oh, to dude. be so devastating. Oh, All right. Oh, this is even oh, worse really? as well. Oh, no. So that is a Lash of the Balrog. And uh, you don't get the you don't get the creature that you sacrifice back. No, you don't, that is part of paying the cost. That creature is dead and gone. Now it was only a lancer, so you know you yeah. don't mind losing that too much with the uh, tempt ability. But still, that's a that's a two for one. No, 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 dude, it's a two for zero. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a lot of value lost. And I mean, you get that little bit of value from the lancer going to the yard. Yeah. But now, if Del Basso wants to just use the lash again. 
you got to get rid of now your ring bared only threat. So doesn't want to do that. Decides to just make it a large 4-4, four -four, which yep. is pretty nice right here. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the Dunlin Cobain here. Oh, no, no. Yeah. We're going to see it as well. Okay. The yeah. treasure token used with the Lash of the Balrog to take yep. care of Eowyn. So... Oh. Delbasso came back from that. That reprieve looked pretty backbreaking, but no, yeah. Delbasso says, ah, it's all good, man. I got it. Yeah, he's got a little reprieve on, on his side as well here. Yeah. Pretty interesting to still attack with that 4-4, four -four, though, here in the face of, you know, uh, a Mary here and other creatures that might be able to get in there, mm -hmm. um, but really trying to win the race here. Love this here. This is a classic play. We see the 3-2 uh, the coming down to draw a card here yep. for... Nathan. Yeah, Aaron Ryder of Gondor, one of the best white commons, if not the best, you I'd know, say so. I would think so as well. Being able to trigger that draw ability off of a ring bearer or any of the legends, as well as even if you don't have one, being able to bottom a card, uh, you know, draw a card, bottom a card is not so bad. Well, something we see a yeah. lot in this format, right? The looting effect, as we call it, drawing yeah. and discarding, drawing and tucking a card away, thanks to mm -hmm. the, uh, the, temp the, the ring tempting you ability yeah so often you'll put cards in your, in your deck that are a little bit situational sometimes yeah. a little bit uh, more marginal than us usual because you can just tuck them away and get rid of yeah. them if you don't need them exactly olokai crusher now the play for del basso and uh, i think it is going to be able to it's firing on all cylinders right because we've got that orc army exactly so we'll be able to block here but here is kind of the nightmare scenario is if nathan can deal with the orc mm. that's going to deal with both blockers here and i do see shire sheriff now do we have a counter to go with it. That would be the ideal, and uh, that looks pretty good. Oh my goodness, yeah, the farmer here is gonna give the uh, Shire Sheriff a little snack so Ooh. as to get rid, and this is the fantastic thing about the Sheriff, right? Against tokens, it's even better than it already is. Exactly, being able to kill the Sheriff can be a liability, yep. especially in combat. Mm -hmm. If you get that creature back and are able to kind of ambush block, not gonna oh happen goodness. with this. This is such a huge yeah. attack now. Mary getting, getting stuck in with the Aaron Rider and the Lancer, so it's back over to Del Basso, who is once again under the pump. Yeah. We've seen Nathan really just turn the screws in his opponent, and this is what, exactly what he has to do, right? Yeah. This Boros deck has to come out of the gates like a Greyhound, really get stuck in, and Del Basso, look at that, a bit of a, uh, bit of a forlorn expression on his face as he tries to figure out what he's going to do to stay in this. Yeah, and it looks like there's only one block avail or one blocker available to deploy here. Yeah and is not able to play both of them here, gets the Goblin Warrior down. Yep. Um, so we'll be able to block with the Crusher. So all Nathan has to do is remove one blocker or maybe boost up a creature. And he's got it as well. The Foray we Orcs perfectly sized to get rid of the Battle Scarred Goblin. Del is going to have a look at that and pack him up. That's all she wrote for game number one. Nathan Stoyer doing exactly what he wanted to yeah. with, his, uh, with his Boros deck there. Uh, Eowyn. Mary, the one-two punch at the start of the game, and Del Basso was really struggling to uh, find his feet. And I think the most important card was Mountain off the yes, top for yep. Nathan. That would have been a completely different, <laughs> game different game if Nathan did not find that land at the exact opportune time. We whiz forward now into game number two here. Nathan Stoyer up a game against Federico Del Basso looking to protect that uh, un both these plays undefeated undefeated Corey undefeated undefeated at maybe one. that title and, uh, is yeah that yeah. title's a little lackluster yeah, after this of, round there's but there's a lot of players who are undefeated at the moment it's uh, I appreciate the hyping yeah. of the players though Riley we, you still got it we was, well <laughs> I'm not sure about that we'll, we'll find that out this weekend anyway we're going to open the account here with a classic magic the gathering play that's a two mana two two got to love it Two mana, two, two, with some upside here if there is going to be some giant goblins or orc, which, you know, Del Basso's deck does seem to produce quite a few of those. There's a lot of the X4 um, goblins, stuff like that, that, that. That ability can come up uh, in this matchup. All right. On the other side of the table here, the three mana. It looks like we get to choose between either the book or Horn of Gondor. Yeah. That card is just incredible. It's so good. And we're going to see Del Basso play. Now, here's the risk, right? Yeah. Here's the risk. If you play the Horn and they yeah. can remove that human, right, you're yeah. playing against a Grixis deck. This is, not, this is not the color combination that humans are focused in, right? You, yeah. If you kill that one human against Boros, they're going to have another human. Exactly. But in this situation, Nathan could take a punt here, yeah. have a go, get rid of this human, and then if Del Basso doesn't have anything, he's just played a three-mana do-nothing. Yep, exactly. Or, you know, if you activate it, or you kill the creature in response to the activation yeah. for a little extra blowout scenario. Yep. And that's the thing, is this this Horn of Gondor, given the time, and given, 
little pressure will just take over every game. It will take over every game, and most of the time, the power of this card lies in the fact that, you know, blue, black, blue, red control decks are very good. When you play against a good old beatdown deck like Nathan is playing, and which is maybe not the best quote unquote strategy to be doing, it really punishes those style, those kind of decisions. I think Nathan's going for the blowout here. I think he's going to try, he's, he's keeping up Smite the Deathless to go after this token when Dalbasso activates the, uh, the horn. Okay, but that is. Del Basso is doing this correctly, waiting until Nathan's turn to uh, make sure to uh, not let Nathan use his mana yeah. on Del Basso's turn. And now it's kind of up to Del Basso if you're going to you know, activate or not. I think you just have to. And I think if Nathan was going to wait the one turn, he's going to wait another turn. And now yeah. with Reprieve this as well. Really yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's really good. This is very high level stuff from both of these players, waiting to see who's going to blink first. And they both know. And they both they know. They both know. They both know, <laughs> dude. Both of these players are on this level here. Eastmark Cavalier gets in for two. We're going to see the activation of the horn. Toot toot. And let's find out what the response is. Smite the Deathless, of course. Yeah. And Del Basso now looking at a very empty board state. So far, the Horn of Gondor not having the impact that he was hoping. Nope, absolutely not. And this is open deck list between these players. So uh, Del Basso knows that there is one removal spell that could have been there. So not only do you just have to go for it, but a little unfortunate to have it line up that way. All right, so Del Basso now. I think he's drawn... I believe that was an envelope that yeah, just got he's reprieved. Yeah, got the inherited envelope that's just been bounced back to his hand. I think that was drawn yeah. this turn because last turn he was considering whether to play the book. Yeah. He's got the Corbain as well. So he was going to have a very good turn yeah. of envelope into either Corbain or the book um, to start getting some creatures going. But as that happened, it did not work yeah. out with the reprieve. And now Nathan just has a hand full of gas. We've seen reprieve do some real work here for Nathan. This yeah. is exactly what you want the reprieve to do, right? Keep the battlefield clear while you've got a little bit of pressure. I think Nathan would prefer to have a bit more pressure at this stage, you know, yeah. wasting some of that mana, tying it up with the uh, with the horn play to begin begin with. But now he's Farthing Farm is going to get in or going to... Uh, help the uh, the Cavalier get in, I should say. Yep. And perfectly fine. Nathan would have liked to land here. I saw Shadow Fax as well in the hand to just be able to have a great attacker and maybe throw in another attacking creature. That would have been ideal uh, for this battlefield, but still not bad at all. All right. And we're going to see now the Eagles of the North, North cycled away for a planes. Yep. Just so. just putting the equity on Shadow Facts here yep. because if you can get that down and attack, let's see if there's any other creature. Yeah, a Faramir. Faramir, dude. They, oh my goodness. Oh, oh wow. My goodness. What a combination there. Just putting in seven power with haste. Is that good, right? It's pretty good, okay. man. Okay. Faramir is not at his best in Nathan's deck because yeah. obviously you want to be try you want to try to be tempted as much as possible when you've got one of those cards, Faramir, Gandalf. Yeah. Uh, who else is there? Galadriel, right? The ones that mm -hmm. reward you for picking someone else as a, as a ring bearer but all the same you're happy to have a faramir on the battlefield yeah in rain or shine back to nathan now big turn for him i think we're going to see shadow facts here there is the four or five now so it's a lot worse you know this turn being able to just throw your shadow facts into the four or five way less than ideal but at this point nathan has to just kind of think like okay how, is it worth it to lose a creature here and it just might be because if you put yeah. in Shadow Facts and Faramir... It's two creatures, right? You get another and you get a 1-1 one, one at the end of the And thing. you get a 1-1, one, one, exactly. Yeah. yeah, look at this. Even if the Kirithungo Patrol is able I, to eat up the Shadow Facts, Faramir like comes in. This is a huge amount of damage. I have to imagine that that, uh, that Cavalier is attacking as well. It's a great attack. Yep. Cavalier into the, uh, uh, into the Kirithungo Patrol. Yep. And uh, I mean, there's two blocks here. You either block Faramir or you block Shadow Facts. Maximize the damage that you can eat up yep. or take care of the card that's going to keep I cranking out these creatures. And you, you're yeah. looking either way, no matter which one you block, you're looking at four power sitting on the battlefield afterwards. Right? Yes. Because either Faramir makes a 1-1 one, one, or you've got the 4-4 four, four Shadow Facts. Exactly. And you just see Del Basso thinking like, oh, one mana, one, yeah. one <laughs> human. Oh my one goodness. mana, one, one human. Dude, he's grimacing. <laughs> oh, he looks like he's in physical pain here. This poor guy, Nathan Stoyer is giving him a proper hiding at the moment. Even with this defensive 4-5 play, the Kirithungo wow. Patrol is just not having the impact that he wants it to. No, absolutely not. And, you know, Del Basso went for the line of, of trying to maximize the horn mm. and with losing the 1-1 to the only removal spell that Nathan really has to yeah. deal with it outside of, like, Shire Sheriff and an early token, which is not necessarily going to be that easy to do. 
just kind of got blown out by it and it set them back. And these little margins like that at the pro level, they're, the, they're, they're everything. Happens. Yeah. We're going to see one of the downsides of the Amass mechanic here because I bet Dalbasso would have preferred to have two separate creatures here just to have maximum blocking flexibility. But no, the Book of Mazabal comes down and pumps up that Orc army that was created by the, uh, the Dunlan Crabane. Looks like Nathan's going to have a chat away from a judge. And this is a good time yeah. to remind people, Corey, mm -hmm. that this is something that you can and should do when you're playing games of Magic. Some people attach a bit of stigma yeah. to talking to judges, uh, especially in sort of higher, more com com competitive level events. Yes. They feel like they're being told on or they're in trouble, like with a teacher at school. Yeah. But as someone who's played professional yeah. Magic for a long time, Corey, you mm -hmm. can tell us, calling a judge, there's nothing personal, there's nothing weird, there's nothing Corey, to get get upset about at any point. Exactly. And I think what Nathan is doing Nathan here is do trying to play for a the orcs and with and the amass know. on the stack, if you can put a pump spell on it to deal more damage, yep. that's what would make sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I'm totally with you. People need to call the judge more and just always clarify. That's really what it's all about. Um, it just matters so much. Wow. Well, after that uh, short deliberation with the judge, Nathan Stoyer sends Shadowfax into the skies. <laughs> and that is going to be a win here for our reigning world champion, our reigning pro tour champion, Nathan Stoyer, the man who cannot be stopped. Yeah. He continues to 2 and 0. So we need to find him an yeah. opponent, Corey. And you forgot to say, with a pro tour top eight Sandwich in, in between that, that's right. Yeah. No big deal. That's no big something deal. we just bypassed because he won too many events yeah. recently. Yeah, so impressive stuff by Nathan Stoyer as per usual. All right, my friends, we're going to take a quick break. We've got another uh, match coming your way at the uh, on the other side of it. Tyler Hatchell versus Mark Peral. We're going to find out who will be playing Nathan Stoyer for this draft pod's undefeated slot. Stick with us. We'll be back in Barcelona after this. And it's a very warm welcome back to Barcelona here in Spain as Pro Tour. The Lord of the Rings continues. Good afternoon to all of you joining us locally from Europe. Good morning to all the early blue birds on the east side of the Americas. And I hope it's a cosy evening over in the Eastern Hemisphere, especially back home for me in Australia. All the people hanging out, chilling with us, watching some Lord, the Lord of the Rings draft here, Corey. It's been fantastic. And we've got more Love of it. it coming their way. Love it. Can't wait to get into this one. Both decks from these players are extremely powerful, and whichever one takes it down goes to play against, you know, some guy named Nathan Stoyer it's in the finals. Way, uh, the final, the end boss here for one <laughs> of these two players, Tyler Hatchell from America here. He's at... Uh, He's down a game, in fact, in yep. this match. We're going to jump into game number two very shortly. Mark Peral on home soil. Hometown advantage. Yeah, I'm not sure if he's from Barcelona exactly. We'll find out exactly where he's from, but uh, he'll be very happy to be playing here. No, he's from a town called Tarragona. 
okay. in Spain. Uh, but he'll look, he'll be happy to be flying the flag for the home team here, Absolutely. especially up one and O oh here against Tyler Hatchell. Uh, the the first game, Corey, I can tell people was uh, quite a long affair. Yep. And we saw the ring uh, tempting people all the way to the top, level four. Uh, and that ultimately was decisive for Peral. But uh, as we say, the winner will go on to face, face Nathan Stoy. So a lot, of lot on the line for these two players. Yep, absolutely. And uh, kind of the reason that these uh, games, that that first game went really long, mm -hmm. looking at both decks, these are kind of the more traditional control decks. We All have right. an Esper control deck mm -hmm. here for Tyler and then an, a very, very strong Is It control deck um, here for Mark. And makes sense how these games went pretty long. This was the deck that I was really interested to see during the draft. The right? blue-red kind of yeah, spells? exactly, right? Yes. Because I saw Stoyer pass some really good red cards, a Smite the yep. Deathless. Uh, I saw that sanction go around as well. He's yep. picked up a flame of Arnor. So this deck looks pretty good. Um, it's yeah. lacking. It's lacking a few key pieces. Yeah, it definitely has this more mid-range, uh, you know, kind of creature plan instead of all spell based. But yes, very good uh, deck regardless. The thing I'm looking for in this yeah. list and not seeing it is the Erebor Flamesmith, mm. right? And there's no fiery inscription either. But I think you're right in saying this is more of a creature focused is it deck rather yeah. than the, the 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 more spell slinger fiery inscription kind of stuff. Yeah, thing. exactly. Anyway, let's yeah. turn our attention to the game here. It looks like we've kicked things off with the Dunlin Crabane on on one side of the battlefield. There is a Haradrim Spearmaster on the other. Handy that the Haradrim Spearmaster has reached this 2-3 blocker in a great spot against the Dunlin Crabane, although we're going to see it go down now. Yep, turning it into a 7-7 here with that, uh, you know, really cool combination here where if you target an Amass creature with that, you will be able to, with Dreadful uh, as the Storm, you will be able to make it into a 7-7. Seven, seven. I just... So kind of ate up a lot of damage here in this spot, but it still did work as a combat trick. I just look at cards like Dreadful of the Storm. I'm just like, no, no, no. I'm not interested in playing this. Yeah. This is so, these cards are so bad, right? I but honestly then, thought it was terrible, yeah. But then in a format that is full of a mass, it yeah. doesn't become target creature as power, you know, 5-5 five, five, whatever. No, yeah. it becomes target... Orc army gets plus five, plus five in blue for three mana. Exactly. And some of the other applications to that is, let's say you're at level three of the ring tempting here, and you can play that card and change the ring bearer to an unblocked creature. Then all of a sudden, you are really, really dealing a lot of damage yeah. out of nowhere. You Inst know? Instant speed temptation uh, can be very, very good. But we're going to see here, birthday escape, some yeah. sorcery speed temptation, and then quarrels end the follow-up here for Peral. Okay, so setting up quite nicely here, getting to level two of the ring, getting some creatures out here, and we'll just see what Tyler has as a follow-up here. Five mana, not use that turn. That's either a, a pretty bad sign or there's some premium removal spells that you don't really want to use on a 1-1 one -one creature. It means you've either got a very interactive hand and you're happy to sit and play a, a more reactive game, or it means that you're looking at a hand that kind of stinks. So yeah, uh, yeah. hopefully for Hatchell's case, <laughs> it, is, uh, it is the former and not the latter here. Here's an incredibly powerful card here. This really looks, oh, you know, dude. pretty innocuous. This card looks so bad, but look at the work it's doing here. Deceive the messenger, right? Minus three, minus oh, make a one, one. And now, looks like the judge is uh, confirming the power and toughness of these different creatures here. And we're going to see, uh, we're going to see this orc army just get eaten up. Yep, and making sure the ring bar bearer is on the Dunlin Curbane, because it works a little strange mm. when you do deceive the messenger on a ring bearer, you know, since it becomes a very, very tiny creature. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. With, with negative power, right. Yeah, you can't block it with anything. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and a powerful card here, Denethor. Oh, Denethor, here we wow. go. The ruling steward. I like this card a lot. This is obviously yes. a card that Hatchell likes enough to splash for it. Yep. Uh, white is the splash in his uh, in his in his deck. We're calling it an, an Esper deck. It, it it is a Demir deck. It's a blue it white, is. a blue blue, a blue black deck splashing for uh, for the Denethor here. Yep, just one planes, and then the powerful land that ended up being a lot better than we thought, kind of going into it. Great Hall of the Citadel. We, We're gonna see that a lot. It's so funny, dude, how there are cards in this set that, like, by normal heuristics, you look at and you're like, no, no, no. That, 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 that's a sideboard that's special. That's a last pick. That's, yeah. a, that's, a fifth, that's a 14th pick special. But no, Great Hall of the Citadel, uh, Dreadful is the Storm. There have been cards that have been, uh, that, that have been just excellent. Yeah, and that's what I love about really deep limited sets mm -hmm. like this. You see metagame shifts. Mm -hmm. You see people learn and then catch on to this stuff. And then there's a next level of the limited. You know, you're, you're kind of picking cards that now are maybe really good again, that kind of metagame shifted out. There's always these different levels from these really strong players, especially at a Pro Tour right after the set comes out. 
we were chatting about this format heading into the event, obviously, Corey, and, and you know, I know you described it as a very skill testing format. Very. For a couple of different reasons. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's very, very, very skill intensive. The ring mechanic is excellent at giving every player a lot of decisions mm -hmm. um, and, and really putting players to the test. And that's and that what's that's what separates the good players from the bad. Or the good players from the great players even. Like yeah. just how many correct decisions you can make in a game. All right. Yeah. We're gonna see Pelaga Survivor here. And that's followed up now with a flame of Arnor. We've actually seen that card make it into all the way into modern. Yeah, absolutely. When there. you compare different wizards with it, you know, yep. there's there's not that many wizards in the Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle Earth, yep. but there are a lot in modern. You know, Snapcaster. Well, snap I was going to say not as many as I'd like with poor old <laughs> Snip Snap not getting the uh, respect <laughs> he used to. That's all right, true. claim the precious. One of the best commons in the set, if not the best. Card. I think it is the best. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just a yeah. clean cut removal spell with upside, three mana. Get rid of this. The ring tempts you. And the Dunlin Crobane's going to get in now. And now we see the looting, activi uh, uh, looting ability activated yeah. thanks to that level two ring. Yeah, level two is really what the ring mechanic is all about. Level one definitely can come up, but once you pair it with the looting ability, that's where it really shines. Then level three, decent, but then level four is, again, a huge stepping stone. Yeah, you want to hit level two, and then you really want to hit level uh, level four. Those are the ones that make all the difference. East Easterling Vanderguard here. Vanguard, uh, the play now for Hatchell who is continuing to keep up the pressure. It's up to Peral now to find a, a sort of a defensive force that is a little a little more meat on the bones of just two one ones. Okay, it looks like we have Smite the Deathless as well as um, Relentless Rohirrim in hand. Four marks, so still, nice still some gas here. Yeah. And it, you have the two lands that you can loot away um, if you can get a ring bearer here. I don't see the ring on either of those creatures at the moment. I don't believe. No, I'm not sure what yeah. happened with his ring bear because he's a level two as well. But uh, yeah. the, the really nice thing about that Smite the Deathless as well on the Easterling Vanguard, mm -hmm. no, no a mass trigger afterwards. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and it looks like both of the birthday escapes were cast pretty early. All oh, right, with no creatures yeah. on the battlefield, sure. All right, so we see now. That was interesting to me, though, to play that second main to not get the ring bearer activation of getting a loot there with having yeah. at least one land in hand. Um, yeah. yeah that, all right, well, played second main phase in any case, and we now have a ring bearer on the battlefield thanks to the Relentless Rohirrim. Again, four mana, four, three. No one's excited about that. Yeah. This card doesn't work. Exactly. I thought this was going to be one of the very lower level commons as well, but the ring tempting you ended up being, you know, not exactly draw a card, but maybe like half of draw a card, and even half of drawing a card, pretty solid and limited. So back to Peral now, and we've seen Hatchel pass. A lot of turns without yeah. really doing a whole lot here. Uh, we have seen him cast some very, very good removal spells, claim the precious amongst them, of course. Oh, look at this, dude. Here we go. Cast there we go. Into the fire. Okay, that is excellent here, being able to just deal with both creatures. And yeah, looking at Tyler's list, I mean, there's plenty of instant speed interaction that you can cast, but maybe just something you don't want to be casting on just the low quality of creatures so far from Mark, but with the 4-3 four free, four free coming into play, uh, that, that is a lot better of a target. So oh, excellent. Nasty End is the perfect response here for Hatchel. He's going to lose the creatures no matter what, but Nasty End drawing him three cards off of that Dunlon Crabane. It was legendary uh, thanks to the fact that it was sparing the ring. Exactly. Yep, that's going to be a very good interaction for everyone to keep an eye on through these limited rounds. Mm -hmm. Ring bearers are legendary, and that adds so much synergy to the rest of the format. Here we go. Look at this. Maybe. Another relentless Rohirrim. The ring is fully activated now at level four, and this is going to make a huge difference. We talked about this, Corey. Yeah. The fact that you can get a 1-1, one -one, an unblockable 1-1 one -one a lot of the time, attacking for four every turn, this ends games very swiftly. It really does. And you can just see by Mark going to combat with that human that there's not a removal spell for the human, or at least you're not trying to target one right away. And that's pretty bad news. An escape from all things. Oh, sorry, excuse me. I trapped in the, uh, oh my goodness me. Uh, isolation. I'll try that again. The isolation at all thank you. We're not escaping from all thanks just yet. We're isolated at all <laughs> There we go. And uh, that's going to get rid of the attacking uh, 
<laughs> relentless row here for now. Yeah. But Hatchell's still under a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure and the fact that you still have a ring bearer that's at least at, you know, level two, which we know it's at level four. But you're going to draw that next turn, you know? So that is a very temporary solution. And that card can be extremely good or it can be extremely average. Speaking of extremely good, how about this one? The yeah. Torment of Gollum. This is one of the best commons in the set, right up there amongst the likes of Claim the Precious. But here, ooh, it's just got rid of that Hithlane Knots in the hands of uh, Peral. And just a two mana, oh sorry, a two two orc army on this on this board. Yeah, you'd uh, you'd really prefer it to a a mass one at this point, which is <laughs> that's true, dude. That's, that's what I true. love about this format is sometimes you want smaller creatures, yeah. you know. So you really have to build your deck in such a way that you can block one ones. If yeah. you just have a deck full of four fours and five fives, you're like, all oh, my creatures are going to be so much bigger than theirs. I'm going to win. Yeah. Not necessarily. It's not very often there that you're like, oh, I'm going to put a two two into play. Can I just make it a one one? Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, just, exactly. Yeah, just stop amassing. It's like <laughs> oh, I got a, I got enough orcs. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Exactly. All right, so back to Peral now. Okay. And what's he found for the turn? Five mana. Oof. Oh, boy. All right, so here we go. This is not... Uh, War Beast. We, we've seen this card do a huge amount of work in... Well, I've seen it do a huge amount of work in green, red. We don't see green all that often. But it's still good if you can just get any four-power creature here. Yeah. The triggered ability of War Beast of Gorgoroth is, uh, is massive, leaving behind a, uh, an army whenever a, a high-power creature dies, four or greater. Yep. And a little bit awkward here as the looting ability from the ring bearer did have to draw that relentless Rohirrim and discard it right away with being hellbent. But it's still worth it to get four damage oh, in from that human. And look at these blocks here, Riley. Like this, the best block here is putting your 2 2 in front of your opponent's 1 1. Otherwise, it's a chump block on the 4 3. Yeah. And, and, and you're like, taking eight. Yeah, this is very much oh looking goodness. like Mark's game to win. Yeah, exactly right here. So uh, he'll be very happy to be getting closer and closer to that 2-0 finish at the end of round number two. Nathan Stoyer waiting in the wings to play off against whoever wins this match here. And at the moment, it's Hatchell who has to find something to get himself back into it. And I just picture either of these players walking out of here hyped to be 2-0 and and then being like, uh, did Nathan win? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> I, you don't even have to ask that question at this point. It'd be like, Nathan won. Right? right? Yeah, not <laughs> yeah. even the right, exactly. All right. Let's see what Hatchell can cook up here, because really, uh, it's up to him on three life, facing a, uh, a fully active ring here. Yep. Okay. Right. We've got another isolation. That's going to tuck yeah, away. Oh, Ooh. no. Oh, no, sorry. It's, uh, it's not the isolation, no. No, that is the horses of... Horses of the Bruin, and exactly yep. right. Yeah, no, I think he, he put down an isolation, right? I think so. Maybe he just, he, gave us, it back. He, he just gave us a very uh, a very brief glimpse at what he's working with before ultimately playing the horses of the Bruin in. So this bounces two creatures, and when you're bouncing tokens, very effective use of the card. Very effective, and with no other ability to tempt with the ring at the moment, you know this this is a good card that Tyler really needed here mm. uh, to at least just stay alive. Yep. Yep. And now Tyler only has one card. Looks like two cards in hand. And Peral now another five mana. And there's the war beast the war that got bound. Yep. Okay. Damage. Nasty damage. Okay. And another nasty end here. Okay, block nasty end, draw a couple of cards. Yeah. That, no, that was legendary. It, the ring tempted him from the horses. Yep. So Absolutely. Draw three. And now. Now he's got to deal with two creatures and ideally exile first, because otherwise, if you deal with both of these yeah. creatures, you're going to still leave behind a gigantic 4 4 mass oh token. Boy. So. Oh boy, really, really tough spot here yeah. for the American. So we saw the one isolation, right? That was kind of flash from Tyler, maybe on an accident from the last turn. Yeah. So that's a way to deal just with flexing. Just yeah. be like, hey, I got this. Look just out for flexing. that. Just flexing. Little but preview. It is pretty big if you can get one blocker to get in front of the 4 3 and then you know, tuck away the War Beast, that's a way to actually kind of stabilize and maybe get into this game. Another card that I'm seeing in the deck from Tyler here that would be very good, Mouth of, man, beat me to it. I was going to say no, Mouth of Sauron. Absolutely perfect here. The, yeah. the Mouth of Sauron is uh, is really nice because, again, it cr it's going to create two bodies here, right? And, and this two is, large ones. Yes, yes. Yeah. And this is what you want in a situation like this where you're facing... He's dealt with the ring bearers, right? Yes. He's dealt with these little one ones that were going to peck away at his life total, and now he just needs some beef. Some beef. Some beef is definitely what Tyler's got now. Now we'll see if there's land four or if we played a land already, because if you can do that, this board is maintained oh, with that. Boy, he's got the island as well. So the isolation is live. Tyler Hatchell fighting back. He is, he is right back in this game now. 
Oh, he's playing an Eastling Van Vanguard instead. Sure. Okay. All right. All right. So instead of playing the Isolation, which we believe is still in hand, two cards left for Tyler. So, yeah. Oh, boy. He's sailing close to the wind, but he's doing a good job. He's doing a great job of staying in this game from a position that did not look hugely advantageous. But that Mouth of Sauron, it's such a good card. One of the most incredible cards. It's my personal favorite Uncommon. I yeah. love these blue-black kind of control-style decks. Uh, I love to, uh, you know, draw a lot of cards, play some birthday escapes with that, Torment of Gollum, and then curve into this card where you can get two large creatures. And oh, dude. Wow. Oh, dude. So the Soothing of Smeagol as well gets rid of the War Beast. So Hatchel just... His, his hand was just pure gasoline, man. Yeah. It's just pure rocket fuel in his hand. It was after those nasty ends. You know, I think the maybe yeah, the hand true. was kind of full of a lot of nasty ends without good creatures yeah. to sacrifice. And once you got to deploy those and, you know, get a three for one, essentially because all these creatures were going to die that were blocked before mm -hmm. it was nasty end, now you really see Tyler's deck kind of firing on all cylinders. And, uh, you know, I mean, outside of one card, the Veracious Fell Beast, Tyler has a lot of the power um, in his deck already on the battlefield, there is also a Horn of Gondor. And we're seeing now a three power ring bearer getting in, right? Dealing yep. a ton of damage. And Peral goes down in game number two. That was an incredible turnaround there. Wow. From Tyler Hatchell. Oh my goodness. I had him dead to rights. He I was did on too. three life, facing down two one ones. Right. <laughs> okay. All right. That doesn't sound that impressive. Setting down a ring bearer that <laughs> was, uh, was basically unblockable on that board. But he managed to claw his way back into that game. Incredible. And I am just hyped we get to see another game between these two awesome players. And, uh, yeah, we'll see who has the ability to be 2-0 and fight for that trophy at a Pro Tour. And it cannot be undersold enough mm. how hard it is to get a 3-0 mm -hmm. at a Pro Tour draft. I yeah. mean, these are just much different drafts than when you're playing on Arena or at your local shop or anything. These players all know exactly what's important, and these matchups and matches end up being very difficult. Denethor now off the Great Hall of the Citadel. Yep. That's the opening play here for Hatchel. We've already seen Peral play a birthday escape. Four mana for him, we see now the star of the show from last game in the Relentless Row here. Good point you make about how difficult these drafts are. If, if, if all's even, I mean, it's hard to get a 3 0 anyway, right? Yeah. It's like, what is it, 12.5%. But it's not that for most of the players in this room. You're sitting down and playing against <laughs> the greatest Magic the Gathering players <laughs> in the world. Yes. Right? Like, you feel like such a fish when you sit across from you, it's like, read you. LSV, you know. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Nathan Stoyer for these poor people in, the, <laughs> in our feature table for, uh, for our first draft. Yeah, really, really tough competition always here. So, all right, here is the Torment of Gollum mm -hmm. looking at this hand and a pretty solid hand. These kind of situations where you have Torment of Gollum and you see counter spells like Sauron's Trickery, or if you see Glorious Gale, especially, where you can just play around these kind of counter spells, it ends up being a lot less impactful. So now at this point, Tyler is going to not necessarily tap out for five mana and jam his best card mm. in the face of, um, you know, an incredibly powerful card here, Sauron's Trickery. Just being able to counter something, Sauron's Trickery, excuse me, being able to counter something and get a body that lays around is so good. One of the best blue uncommons. Absolutely. We see now the uh, the birthday escape take the ring up to three, but I want to come back to the Saruman's Trickery because mm -hmm. we've seen cards like this in the past, right? We see, Well, that this flavor of card. We call yeah. it the cancel with upside. Yes. One blue, blue, counter target spell, get something. You know, yes. scry one, exile it, whatever. This is probably the best cancel with upside. By far. This is closer to Mystic Snake yeah, than for absolutely. me, for any of yep. the, any of the any old school players there. The, the boomers who are watching this on a steam-powered uh, <laughs> Twitch stream. <laughs> Still using dial-up internet. There we yeah, go. Exactly. Ready for the viewers. Shout out to our card viewers yeah. here, giving us a flash. Matej Zalakai, a boomer himself. So oh, yeah. he knows all about this. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, he, yeah. He, he rode here on the back of a Brontosaurus. He's he had his paper boomer. Mystic Snakes on hand yeah. at the event when he came in. Yep. Carved out of stone. He's so old. <laughs> all right. So, that was a much better Torment of Gollum than we saw last time. Uh, played roughly on curve here. And now, the Corsair of Umbar. A pretty middling card, I think. Yep. Is that fair? Am I, being too, am I being fair to the Captain of Umbar? You might be doing a little bit... You might be being a little too fair to oh, that. Really? You know, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it really is not a premium common. And that is what Tyler is doing in the face of a face-up counterspell. Yep. You know that's... Or we could probably think that's not Tyler's best card in hand. But something to play, gain more stuff on the battlefield, and uh, either force 
the counter spell on a weaker card or you know, wait uh, to fish it out a little bit later. The soothing of Smeagol now targeting the Relentless Row here and to send it back up into Mark Peral's hand. Is this going to prompt the Saruman's trickery? I think it has to. This is just too much of a tempo loss. Uh -huh. If Mark was able to recast it and have Saruman's trickery, then I think maybe you wouldn't have to counter this. But I think that, that tempo loss here is just a little sure. bit too brutal at this mid-stage of the game. And one thing I also want to bring up, this match has probably went on for a while with game one being a little long, so True. maybe players are also trying to hurry up a little bit uh, with maybe time being a factor. Well, for any, any players who are maybe just joining us for their first Pro Tour broadcast, yep. welcome, by all means welcome. But Corey, talk us through what uh, is involved when it comes to time uh, at, at these professional level events. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, when time gets called at these events, you will have five extra turns mm -hmm. uh, to finish it up. And, you know, a draw is fine maybe when you're in day two you know you'll see a lot of players intentionally draw to make it into the top eight but a draw in day one is as close to a loss as it gets yeah you know so it's, it, it's really not what you want it, it's not what you want to be starting your tournament with one and one 101 very similar records here um so these players do want to avoid that but with this format being a little bit slower a little bit grindier uh this can definitely happen yep the 50 minute rounds usually are enough in most situations but sometimes when things slow down when you've got slow decks the other thing about this i don't think we're going to see this in modern mm -hmm. but I, I broadcast tournaments where you know the format has been glacial yeah and you get in that draw bracket because you're playing a slow deck and <laughs> all you're doing dude is playing against other slow decks yep. it's a nightmare blue white control mirrors yeah. as far as the you eye can two, see two oh and four it's awful <laughs> it's awful <laughs> All righty. All right, so we have the Torment of Gollum taking out the War Beast here, amassing a little extra power here, getting that army up to a 4-4. Looks like it's going to be on blocking duty as Denethor and the 2-3 get in for some chip shot damage. So the Captain, Captain of Umbar joining Denethor. And what's Peral's response here for two mana? Jeez, he's thinking about it. Oh. Okay. Okay, it's a Hithline Knots. All right. That leads me to believe that we are trying to get a little aggressive here. Yeah. Yeah, trying to get a blocker out of the way. And Hithline Knots, a really nice card when it comes to being able to scry first and draw. Yep. You know, the scry mechanic maybe necessarily wasn't the most powerful thing. Doesn't really compete with, you know, ring tempting mm -hmm. style cards, but still pretty solid on a battlefield when you're late in the game. And look at this now. We see the ring go all the way to the fourth level with this... Uh, Relentless Row Hiram, and very wisely choosing the 1-1 one, one, uh, Orc Army as the ring bearer here. We've seen a lot of ring temptation happening uh, in this game. It looks yeah. like, I think, it feels like both players have, have sort of achieved that critical mass of being able to get the ring to level four. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we are going to see a pretty large attack here. This is an attack for eight, essentially. If you uh, um, count in the chapter four, three life lost here from the ring. And this is a large attack putting Tyler down to four as there was no blockers available. And we'll see what Tyler can do. Tyler has a nice battlefield as well, but I caught a peek at Mark's hand there, and it looks like we have Smite the Deathla Deathless, excuse me, um, as well as Cast Into Fire. Yeah, Smite the Deathless, uh, a pretty good removal spell. You know, a lightning strike, basically. Yeah. A bit of upside against stuff like Easterling Vanguard, oh, it's as, amazing. as we've already talked about. Uh, this is a card you're always extremely happy to play in your deck. There are creatures that embarrass it a little bit. Denethor is one of them. You know, that four yeah. toughness mark. Eowyn, another card that we've seen already today, mm -hmm. um, makes it a little awkward. But look, you're not complaining. Yeah. You'll, you'll play, you, you take Smite the Deathless, you're happy with it. Definitely. I think it's one of the best red cards as well. Rest, bed, best red commons, excuse yeah. me, I believe. Yep. So now, it looks like Tyler's thinking carefully about what he wants to do. And for two mana, what are we going to see in play here? Two mana, let's see. We already have the Soothing of Smeagol. Mm -hmm. That's probably not the number one option. Could be the Vanguard. He's got three copies of that. Yep. This is very much the slow down turn. Like, this yeah. is going to be the turn that kind of decides the game when you just had a massive attack here for eight uh, coming right at you. And the one thing Tyler does not have is the ability to just have a 1-1 one -one blocker. And, oh, this is great. Oh, yeah. This this card, not necessarily what you want to be doing no, and dude. putting it on a mass token. Not at all. Yeah. But excellent here when you have a 1-1 one, one In this situation. Ring bearer. It was great. Whatever it is, you will use it to get rid of yeah. the uh, the ring bearer here. So Bewitching Leechcraft doing its job. 
And now just a pair of Relentless Rohirrim for Mark Peral. Hatchell not attacking, of course, on four life. Yep. Those, those, uh, those Rohirrim are both lethal individually. And with three mana available, there could easily be a trick from Tyler here to really prevent something. Dreadful as the Storm is something that kind of sticks out to me looking at the list. Could also be some of those nasty ends to be yeah. able to deal some, uh, get some value out of a chump blocker. We did see a lot of value gained off of the nasty ends last time. And uh, with a Denethor out too, you're going to get even more value. Yeah, unfortunately, that oh, does only on your, trigger on your, your step, term. Okay. Yeah, that card would be awesome if it could trigger uh, on your opponent's turn as well. Yeah. Already great. It's already, already very great. good, but yeah, no, you know, I, I guess you're not often casting nasty ends in your own turn while you're chump blocking. Yeah, I can't, absolutely. I, I wonder if there's a card that allows you to do that. I don't know. It's well beyond <laughs> the purview of the, of the of this draft format in any case. All right, here's the smite, the, de the deathless we talked about. Uh, it can go after the 2-3. And there. here's going to be the dreadful as the storm check, you know, because yeah. this is an excellent dreadful as the storm counter spell, plus make a bigger blocker. Or Nasty End, you know? I mean, this is really a check on multiple cards, mm -hmm. and Tyler will be very happy to have either one of those. Looks like we do not have the Dreadful as the Storm, or not valuing it enough. No, Nasty End. I think that was discarded. Oh, discarded the, Nasty Discarded end? to the loot. Oh, sure. The, yeah. uh, the activation of the, uh, of the captain. Excuse me. Right, right. Uh. All right. Interesting. Okay. All right. I mean, so that... goes. Exile. If I would be looking at that as Mark... I would be uh -oh. thinking, wow, this is a very strong hand. If you're discarding Nasty End instead of casting it. Yeah, something must be going on. But here's a breaking of the Fellowship now, targeting the Orc army, which will, uh, if this resolves, slay the Denethor. This is a lethal spell yeah. here because you are able to attack with two four threes. So this is going to put the pressure on Tyler to see if you have anything to stay alive or if this is just GG. I, qu I caught a quick glance at Tyler's hand and I see Mouth of Sauron, a very good play to play next turn. Uh, not when you're on zero life. Ex yeah, zero oh life does boy. make a lot of things tougher. Okay. So, I, so what have we just seen there? The the uh, the Orc army was, was um, sacrificed to the Denethor here. Yep. Yeah, this was... And that means that it, you're, you're on five life and not just dead to the Relentless row here. And we're going to see a yeah. chump block go to one. Brutal. Yep, it, it had to be sacrificed there. Denethor was the target of the removal spell yeah. to deal with. But this just keeps Tyler alive. And we do get to All see right. the Marth of, so one Marth life, of Sauron. One life, baby. One life. It's not zero. Mouth of Sauron comes down. And how big is this amass token going to be? So you can, you know, getting a count of both graveyards here, you can target your opponent, you can target yourself as well, usually just choosing the bigger, or, you know, if it's pretty close, you target yourself. Yep, targeting, uh, targeting himself here, Tyler Mills yep. 3. And here we go, just like last game, where Tyler just, you know what, wanted to make it entertaining for all oh of boy, us to yeah. live <laughs> by one life. <laughs> But that is, is that a 6-6 six, six or a 9-6? Six, six. Okay. It's a 6-6, six, six, wow. dude. Yep. All right. So big enough. Big enough. But Peral. Mark's tapping fast. Very happy to see. Okay. No, no. We cast into the fire. De uh, discarded to a quarrel's end. That makes a 1-1. One, one. Okay. That doesn't do it. Is there a way to push through these attackers? Now, the one thing you can do is attack with your ring bear and force the trade with the Mouth of Sauron because yep. that army is too large to block. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, I mean, Tyler's fine with that. You're blocking with the mouth. <laughs> yeah. No matter what. Instead of going to, to negative Instead of going to, to negative three? whatever? <laughs> well, it's, it's close. It's a close call. We'll see how these Pro Tour level players uh, decide <laughs> to address that particular decision point, Corey. All right. That looks like a Haradrim Spearmaster in hand. And a Smite the Deathless number two, it looks like. Oh, Neither of dude, which. Smite the Deathless. Oh, no. The four, the four toughness on the, uh, the mouth of Sauron. Okay, Absolutely so decisive. this is going to be force blocks, as you see right yep. there, and then sure. smite the Deathless to finish off the army and put this little 1-1 one -one as the only creature mm. where it puts Tyler to the test once again. And it's lethal. It is lethal. This 1-1 one -one is demanding an answer here from Tyler Hatchell, who untaps now with six mana. That Mouth of Sauron was able to stem the bleeding, but will he be able to defeat the might of this lethal attacker next turn? The humble 1-1. One -one. Eastling okay. Vanguard, that's going to do it. That's going to be enough here to get us another turn. Yep. Let's see what Mark has available. Only two Smite the Deathless. We've seen both of them cast, I believe, this game. So there's no way to cleanly answer the Vanguard here for Mark Perra. Yeah, not looking like it. Yeah, any Easy. removal spell just allows that Amass token to then block as well. But there is the uh, the Haradrim. 
I think that was a Lorien revealed as well, so a way to draw some extra cards, but values the battlefield right now a little bit more. Wow, what a great match between these two players. And a reminder, they are in the pod with Nathan Stoyer, so yep. the winner of this game will go on to play against Nathan Stoyer and see who wins the pod. Okay, Arwen's gift. All right, that's a nice one here. Uh, Scry's two, I think I saw a land put on the bottom there. Pretty, I oh don't know, gonna have, to, gonna have to think about it actually. Okay. Are we top top? He likes what he sees. Mountain and a mystery card drawn off of the Arwen's gift. That's Tyler shaking his head like, oh no, if you kept both yeah, on you top. Yeah, oh, that's always a bad feeling. And oh my goodness, it's wow. Gandalf Sanction. Okay, so that card, Nasty N counters it though. Straight away counters oh, it. Dude, of course, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You don't get the trample damage over, but. And then there's an answer as well for the Spearmaster. Wow. Incredible here as Tyler just refuses to go down. Isolation at Orthanc after the nasty end effectively counters the, the quote unquote trample damage of the Gandalf sanction. And now it's the Bath Song. Mark Peral just desperately trying to find a way to deal this final point of damage. Corey. Unreal game. We saw two spells here from Mark off the top. I didn't catch what the other blue card drawn was, but it was indeed a spell. And there's that dice in the middle of our screen. Oh, that so is we're turn. on turns. We're on turns, dude. Time has been called. So can Hatchell <laughs> stick around long enough here? So Tyler cannot win. Tyler cannot yep. win this yep. match, but is now playing for the draw mm -hmm. um, as there's just not enough power in Tyler's deck. But Mark needs a haste threat. This is his last turn to do some attacking. I don't know, I don't know is, if man. there is. Gandalf, I don't know what there is. Gandalf Sanction was the card. Yeah, Gandalf Sanction was uh, was the big the big finisher here for Mark Peral, but he doesn't have it. No, yeah, I'm not seeing anything. I think this is going to end I in a draw. It. I think this is it. And and you know what? I know I know this is a draw, right? But it feels like a win for Tyler, right? Mm -hmm. This yeah. feels like t Tyler did such an incredible job of staying alive in this game and in this match, right? Not going down. And look, you know, yeah. stuff isn't going to in a draw. It never feels great for either player. But I think yeah. Tyler in this situation can say... Who boy. Yeah. I did it. Well, I didn't do it, but I did not do it. Exactly. And, you know, with that Gandalf sanction, you know, there's other options that you can kind of do. You can maybe wait a little bit. There was that option to just attack with the creature. And uh, if you were able to just block Nasty and the blocker then, maybe the next creature that was played, then you Gandalf sanction, maybe that could have changed the texture of the game a little bit. Mm -hmm. Who knows? But, I mean, when you see that lethal that way to lethal oh, on top. You smell, it's so there's blood, tempting. Blood in the water, dude. Exactly. Oh, yeah, I got it. I can, <laughs> I can smell victory on the wind, he says. But no, unfortunately, uh, look, a great a great performance from him as well. His yep. deck looked really good. Um, not the traditional is it deck that we normally see, a, a little more creature-focused and spell-focused. But yeah. uh, just the way things broke out there, I think Tyler did a really good job staying in it. So now the strange thing yeah. is the winner was going to play Nathan Stoyer. So now one of them yeah. is going to play Nathan <laughs> Stoyer, <laughs> depending on how it works. And so. we're going to find out very shortly, my friend. Friends, we're going to chuck it back over to the news desk. Maria standing by to talk you through what uh, what's next on the agenda. And uh, in a few short moments, my friends, coverage of Pro Tour The Lord of the Rings will continue. So stay with us here in Barcelona.